Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we're thrilled that you have tuned us in and welcomed us into your home. Well, we want to hear from you during this live show, so give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-9460. 2980, and you can always send us an email, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Well, first, we want to express Amen. our condolences and great sorrow that our nation is bearing right now for all those whose lives have been lost in Florida, 17, I believe the total is, and um, those who were injured and for all the families yes. and tomorrow also EWTN will be having a rosary for that on right after the right. mass on right. tomorrow. Right. So prayers, love, <sighs> unity going out to all of you there in Florida, Broward County, that high school, everyone who's been so impacted there. The Holy Father himself has said that he's praying for you, holding you before the Lord in his heart. So we're all united together. Somebody said in some of the interviews, well, you've just, something like this, well, you've just seen the worst of humanity, mm. and tomorrow you're gonna see the best of humanity. So that can't bring back your loved ones, and it doesn't stop the trauma that's taken place. But the best of humanity, <clears throat> the best of our Lord is coming your way. How we need a new culture mm -hmm. of life. And so speaking about a culture of life, we have on the phone with us Sean Carney, President and CEO of 40 Days for Life. Sean, can you hear us? Welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. I can. It's good to be back. How are you doing today? Oh. Well, good. I bet you're so excited. Tell our family at home all that is happening with 40 Days for Life as they kick off their new spring campaign. Yes, well, this is the uh, largest spring 40 days for life campaign we've ever had and and it's always done in conjunction with the season of lent and so uh you know ash wednesday as we all found out this year was very early happening yesterday on uh saint valentine's day so it's one of the coldest campaigns as well but we have 354 cities that have been kicking off since last weekend i just returned from spokane washington uh, where they're kicking off uh, uh, 10 years of 40 Days for Life. They did their first campaign in 2008. And so it's just been a joy to see so many people uh, going out, despite the cold, to pray for an end to abortion. And it really speaks to the momentum that we have right now in the pro-life movement, that it's, it's not slowing down. It's only growing uh, year after year. Well, we were out in front of our last remaining abortion mill in Birmingham, Alabama. You know, we had seven abortion mills that we have prayed at since 1988. We only have a Planned Parenthood left. And it was just so powerful to be out there. And uh, one of the readings that was done uh, from the Holy Scriptures was from the book of Joel. Uh, you know, rend your hearts and not your garments. You know, with, with weeping and fasting and mourning come. Uh, sound the alarm, and we, we heard that mm. there as we were between the abortion center and the streets. And that evening, I got to read that scripture at Mass. And before I read it, one of the ministers said to me, Jim, when you read this, try to read it with some emotion and feeling. And I said to this minister, I said, you know, we read this scripture out in front of an abortion mill last night, and if you were there, you would have wept. Mm. I said, because to read scriptures yeah, it, like that... It, it, it's Go ahead. a beautiful yeah. scripture and a beautiful reflection uh, as a reminder. I, I love Lent. I don't know if it's my Irish genes, but yeah. uh, I love Ash Wednesday, and I love Good Friday, and these wonderful, rich reminders that the Church gives us throughout the year uh, that we are not our own. You know, our mm -hmm. life is a gift, something we really need to remember as we look at the tragedy, uh, you know, happening in, in Florida. Um, you know, life is a, is a gift. It is precious, and it has to be stood up for. It has to be protected. 
And it has to be celebrated. And I think, you know, we we sort of live in this culture of self and social media and me, me, me. And and here we are. I'm told every year, usually by uh, a number of priests that I have, that Ash Wednesday is the most attended mass day in the in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so we it's not a holy day of obligation, as you know. And so we like being reminded that from dust we came and dust we shall return. And I think it's a great uh, reminder and should give us great hope that we long um, to, to be reminded that we are creatures, mm. and you know, we, we live in a culture of death, and we have to value our lives. And Ash Wednesday really helps us do that. Sean, tell us how people might be able to participate. What components are there? What aspect can we participate? Do we all have to be on site? What could you do off site? Tell us about well, that. Well, for those people who, who cannot go to a vigil, if you can't go to a vigil, go. That's the right. first thing. We've had 750,000 people participate. If you go to 40daysforlife.com, you'll see all 354 locations. Pick the one closest to you and sign up and go to the vigil. If you can't go to the vigil, sign up for the email updates. We send out stories of babies saved, of workers who, who have a change of heart and leave their jobs. Uh, we also send out daily scripture reflections and, and, and uh, prayers led by different uh, national leaders. And so uh, get on the email list if you're not on there already. Uh, you're also welcome. Folks can get the, the, the new free pro-life magazine that we have. We have a great issue coming out. They can sign up for that at 40daysforlife.com slash magazine and get the free magazine. Uh, do something. Pray along with us and with so many people around the world. 25 countries right now are participating in 40 Days for Life. The Cardinal uh, in Guatemala today oh. gave uh, a plenary indulgence for anybody who participates in 40 Days for Life there. So there's a lot of unity going on, and there's a lot of prayers, and our culture needs that. So follow along uh, on the website or on the email updates. But most importantly, if you can, go out and, and participate. It, it has a tremendous impact, as you all have seen in Birmingham. Sean Carney, thank you so very much. President, CEO, 40 Days for Life. God bless you, and God bless this great worldwide mission. Thank you so God much. God bless. Keep up the great work. Thank Likewise. you. Well, now we have guests. When we go to break, we'll come back, and we will have Grace Gibbons with us. She is the founder called The Mommy Experience. She has a website. It's called KayleeBear0922.blogspot, where she is a blogger. So if you want to connect with her after you hear about her, um, we want you to be able to do that. So and Joy, it's a special show about special needs, especially families that are experiencing children with autism. And Grace has some incredible insights. So please stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss the rest of this show. We'll be right back. Back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you today during our live show. If you have a question for our guest today, Grace Gibbons, you're just to give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling in your outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. And you can always send us an email during the show, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com, and hopefully we'll use your question or your comment right here on the air. Well, on Thursdays, we like to go to our pro-life update, and we get that from Katherine Zeltner, except now, I told you this last week, Katherine is no longer Katherine Zeltner, wow. but her new name is Hadro, so she's Katherine Hadro, <laughs> and she went and got married a couple of weeks ago, but she's back with a pro-life news for us. So Katherine, what do you have for us this week? And God bless you, and we're excited that you're married. See Jim and Joy. This week, the White House unveiled its budget proposal for the next fiscal year, and it includes a way to defund Planned Parenthood. We discussed this strategy and its likelihood for it to be implemented with our expert Autumn Christensen and with Senator Steve Daines of Montana. 
And as we do each week on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, we are asking our viewers to get involved in the pro-life movement. This week, you can do that by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. That's ProLifeWeekly.com. And send the Trump administration a thank you for the many strong pro-life appointments and key government positions. There are highly qualified public servants who are pro-life working in multiple levels in the government right now. And we want to share our gratitude for this. So be sure to follow this week's call to action and go to ProLifeWeekly.com to thank the administration for these appointments. We have much more in this show. I hope to see you all tonight on EWTM Pro-Life Weekly Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern and again on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Now, back to you at home. Well, thank you, Catherine Hadro. That's going to be fun. Well, we uh, have a beautiful guest for you today. Her name is Grace Gibbons, and she is the founder of The Mommy Experience. She's married. She has five children. She's going to tell us all about her little journey of life thus far. Well, Grace, we want to welcome you to At Home with Jim and Joy, and we're delighted to have you. Thank you for having me. Well, you've come from Pennsylvania, and um, we want you to tell our family at home a little bit about your journey, um, being wife and mother, and all the things that's happening as you journey to holiness. <laughs> <laughs> and your own um, journey of faith. Yeah. Yes, um, there wasn't always like that. There was a period of time. I attended Ave Maria University in uh, 2004 to 2006. Um, shortly after that, I had fallen away from the faith. Um, I didn't really know what my mission was. I didn't know what it was that God uh, was calling me to do. Um, and I just kind of floated through life, didn't really know. I kind of didn't even um, touch into prayer anymore. Um, and then later on, I just, I met my husband and I felt like this was the first time uh, that I could really see where God's purpose was for me. Mm. Um, he was the first man that really taught me how to love mm. and um, what it was to be loved. So I kind of just went with it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty important <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> He's a big part of my life. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So you went through this crisis time in your life. Your husband was really used to turn you around or just to help affirm the essence of your own being mm -hmm. um, and so things began to level out after that point your faith was restored how did the faith come back to you or you um, to the faith well we we were dating for a very short time and I became pregnant um, with my first daughter and it was a difficult time because neither of us was close to the faith he's a baptized Catholic as well and it was during that time that he and I uh, we weren't too sure as to what to do. We both had our own histories that we needed to rectify and kind of had closure with. Uh, we didn't know how to do that. And I had said to my husband, I felt like there was like this light that went on because I felt this life growing inside of me. Right. And I knew that God had to be center. God had to be the focus of everything that we did from that point on. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to return to the faith. Uh, we went into pre -cana. he asked me to marry him. Mm -hmm. uh, we went into pre -cana and it just kind of took off from there. Uh, shortly after we finished pre -cana, my husband was in a very terrible car accident. Mm -hmm. um, and he was in a coma for about eight or nine days. Oh. And at that time, I was about eight months pregnant now. Wow. We had just finished mm -hmm. uh, pre -cana and we were scheduled to be married the following month because uh, we wanted to be married prior to her birth. And he was now laying in a coma. Um, so it was during that time for about eight days, I just prayed really, really hard mm -hmm. uh, to bring him back. And God did, and he woke up. And uh, it was just so intense because I felt I had been forgotten. I felt like, you know, I didn't know where I was going in my life. I knew I had this man that loved me so much. Yeah. I had this life growing inside of me. And I finally decided, you know, this is my purpose. I have to be here for him. I have to take care of my little one. I have to really make God the focus now. And I and I couldn't have been more intimate with Christ when I when I begged for his yeah. life back. Yeah. And when he woke up, I knew that this was God's purpose yeah. for me. So it was the first time in a very long time that I knew yeah. this is what God yeah. wanted for me. God's graciousness is just so awesome and so amazing, isn't it? Mm. I mean, because you're, you're sharing your story, some things are out of order in your story in terms of when you got pregnant and not married and so on. And right. Isn't it nice that God doesn't hold a grudge or something? Like, <laughs> He uses everything and 
He's just waiting for us to come back to him. And even before right. we come back to him, he's doing so many good things. And, yeah. you know, he's not counting the things we've done wrong. And right. like you said, I'm going to use all of this to really assure you of who you are as a woman. And that feminine genius, you feel much like a genius, but the feminine right. genius of what it means to be a mom and a nurturer and a, and a wife and wanting the best stuff. And he takes all the ugly stuff and wrong stuff and bad decisions and somehow uses it all. Right. to bring you to this place so right y you got married you have this your first well child. our daughter was um my husband was now at a, a rehab facility trying to learn how to walk and so forth he was uh he had a lot of uh injuries and uh, our daughter was five weeks early so i was you know going back and forth every day helping take care of my husband and well no he wasn't my husband yet but taking care of him and um i one day i just didn't feel right and I was taken to the hospital and she was born. She was five weeks early. And then 10 days after that, we, we finally did get married okay. in the church. Mm, okay. yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. And how, what's his journey of health now? Uh, my husband's recovering well. Mm -hmm. um, he's had a series of, um, you know, surgeries and therapy and things like that. Uh, as of right now, he, he couldn't be better. I mean, he has some issues. He has mm -hmm. some issues with his hip and his, his mm -hmm. foot and his vision. His vision in the right eye is not totally complete. Um, and we have a journey ahead, but yeah. we have faith, so mm -hmm. he's going to be fine. Well, you have definitely had a journey. So you had this first beautiful child, and mm -hmm. you wind up having four more children. Yeah. You're married and solid you know, in the Lord. Yes. Um, two of your children are special needs children. Yes. Yes. Tell us about them, uh, your journey with them, what this has led to in terms of what you're learning about their special needs and communicating this with others. Um, well, I was about six, uh, my eldest daughter was about six or eight weeks old when I got pregnant with my second daughter, Kaylee. Um, Kaylee is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, she was, it was back in about February 2014 uh, when she was diagnosed. She was about two and a half. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was so immersed in motherhood, um, I thought to myself that something wasn't exactly right with her. And, you know, based upon my, oh, my eldest daughter, who is typical, mm -hmm. and I was in denial for a while. Um, my husband would say things, and my friends would say something, or my yeah. aunt would say something like, no, she's a baby, she's fine, she's fine, she's fine. What would they say? What were, what were some of the things that they were recognizing that you weren't recognizing, or that you recognized, but that you refused to believe? Because um, that's, that's very common, that happens. Yeah, uh, well, she wasn't really looking at me. Uh, she was nonverbal um, till a little bit after she was uh, diagnosed with autism. Uh, she was very antisocial. She wasn't able to really engage with children on the playground or um, be able to play with her sister or um, crawling late, you know, doing, not really meeting her milestones. Um, but the biggest two components was that she wasn't looking at us and she wouldn't answer to her name. Mm -hmm. So for a while, my husband and I thought she was deaf you know, maybe, okay, she's deaf, maybe, um, but no, because she would look at the TV and watch and smile, and well, okay, she's not deaf. Um, so it was thereafter we took her to our local library where they had a class for special needs, okay. and there was a lady there who was in charge of the program, and she came up to me and my husband, and she said, well, what brings you here today? Why did you bring your daughter? And we, we explained to her what was going on, and she says, oh, well, your, your daughter might have autism. And we were like, well, what's autism? We yeah. had heard about it. We didn't really know much about it. Mm. And I, you know, she said, give me a card to the county we were living in. And she said, this is the number you need to call. You need to get some evaluations, you know, get the process going. And me, my husband, what process? What mm. does this mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's wrong with her? Like, we couldn't understand what, you know, what this really meant. Right. It wasn't until we started getting her evaluated and getting the, you know, the ball rolling that we had a serious mission on our hands to really uh, guide her in life, that it was gonna be a whole different journey than it was for our, for our eldest. And then a year and a half later, my son was also diagnosed with autism, mm -hmm. and he also has two types of epilepsy as well. So Did the pediatrician, was the, were there any markers as in her development with the pediatrician recognize anything? Did he say anything to you? How did that go? Um, well, her pediatrician, uh, she, she had mentioned it to me a couple of times, I mm -hmm. think around the age of, she was about, I would say 11 or 12 months old, and she had written it on her, her chart, mm -hmm. and had given me a referral, and I, 
I ignored it because I, I didn't I didn't I didn't know much about autism mm -hmm. to even consider it, right. and I just w didn't want to take away her being a baby. You know, I didn't want to all of a right. sudden be putting her into all of these different centers and therapies. I just wanted her to enjoy life and, mm -hmm. and just be a baby. Mm -hmm. um, so I ignored it. But then as time went on, my mommy got kicked in mm -hmm. and I decided, you know, there has to be something that, has, that we have to do for mm -hmm. her because I didn't want her to at any point feel that she was any less important than any other child who mm -hmm. would need special anything right. that they require in life. And why would this be any different? So we, we really embraced it. It was about February 2014. We really started to hit the road running mm -hmm. and, you know, giving her everything that she deserved. And we had already been uh, pretty savvy on the process and what it is that she needs and her therapies and strategies and all of that uh, by the time my son was diagnosed. So when we heard that, I was de uh, even then I was in denial about my son. Mm -hmm. Didn't want to hear it. He's a baby. Don't, you know, I'm here for Kaylee. I don't, don't want to talk about my son. And yeah. And then we embraced my son as well and started getting him the services he needed. Um, mm -hmm. he's, there are questions about the spectrum. So there's lower functioning, higher functioning. My daughter is much lower functioning than my son. Um, my son never had an issue with looking at us. He never had an issue of communication or engagement. Um, so she's kind of on the lower end of the spectrum and he's kind of on the higher end of the spectrum. But both of them require the same amount of, and this is the gist of the mommy experience. They both have their own dignity. They have the both desire. They both have a desire to be loved, mm -hmm. um, to be cared for, just like we would do for any right. anybody else, whether mm -hmm. or not they have special needs. Um, so, with the two of them kind of being the catapult to uh, strengthening our faith, my husband right. and I together um, has really changed our lives. Mm -hmm. Totally. Because it, it could have went the other way, right? Sure. Because in sometimes in a faith journey you know, you could think, God, why is this happening to me? Um, oh, sure. You know, like, mm -hmm. really? You know, because, uh, like you said, you went into denial. And because and, and, it's a hard truth. Right. It's a hard truth that you have to embrace because it's going to, to know this information is going to change your life forever and it's going to change her life forever. Right. And then to have that on your faith journey, it's like, so you, at no point did you, question God, get angry at God, Wh what was your response in your faith about no, hearing that No, news? even even during the time when I had fallen from the faith, it was of my making, mm -hmm. it was of my doing. Um, I never said, oh God, why did you do this to me? This is your fault, or blaming people around me. I kind of just, I went into isolation spiritually. I just kind of didn't want to embrace the realities around me that God was kind of poking at me and saying, no, yeah. this way, don't go this way, <laughs> kind of go this way. Um, when Kaylee and Sean both got diagnosed, I actually felt closer um, to God. I really, and that's been the center of our marriage. It's been the center of our family, uh, the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, um, ha developing uh, this intimate relationship with Christ and being able to participate in the cross fully, sufferings and joys yeah. together. Yeah. Um, and that's really been able to give us the perspective of life in terms of dignity and, and needs and uh, being able to provide for our children yeah. everything that God would want for them. Mm -hmm. And this, what you're sharing is what really has intrigued us in reading your blog and, and your, your sharings. It's this duality and also coming together to some degree of science. Yes. I mean, thank God for somebody, it may not been science, but other people that were saying to you, we see something here, and then you went to that special needs group, and somebody had more scientific information to say, these are symptoms of something, right. so you learned the science about it. So science is beneficial, is, is your sharing, but, but you also share about uh, the human person, uh, humanization of these people, that they're, they're simply people with the special condition that they have mm -hmm. and a different way of seeing and applying Catholicism to that child, to you, to your marriage, to the other siblings. Right. You call it uh, Catholicism. 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 So you got the cat order. Autism. Autism. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, she unpack this more for us because it's not simply you didn't lose faith and God is with you. You're you're applying you're seeing, you, do, you speak a good bit about seeing differently. 
Right. You know, that, that phrase that we like to use that somebody had said, change the way you see and see how you change. And so science can give us facts, but it can't necessarily, well, maybe it could help us to change the way we see, but speak about this. Um, well, I think Faith sci in science. Sure, I think science is very important. I think the mistake that society makes is that it's a religion. Um, I do think it's, it's part of the experience with autism, um, but it has a missing component. Uh, okay. It has this potential um, to be uh, this masterpiece of God, this poetic verse of life um, that I think people are missing. And with that, I like to refer to two great people, um, the Venerable Bishop Sheen yeah. and C.S. Lewis. So Bishop Sheen talks about science. He talks about the three main components of science being the first benefits. So we have medical research, experiments, cures, and so forth. Uh, the second being the purity of science, uh, but we have the glory of science kind of designated to one field right. um, according to what can be measured, right. which again, these are all good things that God intends, yeah. but this is aside from religion. This is just, you know, right. using our common sense. And then the third, Bishop Sheen talks about um, the humanity of science. Um, that we have these laws of nature, uh, the laws of the universe that have been determined and authorized by God, that we as human persons are, are supposed to extract out of these laws what God intends, these ideas, like a camera, right? You wrap it up in things like steel and iron and wires, and we now have the idea of a camera. We extract out what, of God, what, it, what it is that God is trying to convey to us. Um, and that's where I apply it to autism. This third component is so essential because here we are, God has given us, according to the laws of science, right. autism. Right. What are we extracting out of autism that gets us closer to him, that yeah. gets us to understand what it is that he intends and wills for us? Um, and, and for me, the, on the premise of the mommy experience is love. It is a gift that God gives us to extract love, more understanding, more compassion, um, more, more love of the human person, being able to understand the dignity of the human person, mm. participating in the love of Christ, uh. um, participating in the, in the sufferings and the joys of the cross, coming to him on the yes. cross. C.S. Lewis, um, I was reading his book, Miracles, a Preliminary Study, and I had written an article called The Miracle of Autism. And I got a lot of good feedback, some not so much, but yeah. a lot of people were very responsive to it. And uh, C.S. Lewis says, in science, we have been reading the notes to a poem. In Christianity, we see the poem itself. So here I apply to autism because we have science, the research, the data, the physiological evidence that autism exists and that life exists. But it seems to have this potential, um, this missing component yeah. that hasn't been actualized yeah. yet. But here, if we invite the cross, and we invite Christ, and mm -hmm. we invite God. Well, let's, let's pause right there. Sure, You're really sure. sharing some incredible gems, and we want to get back to these. Okay. Sharing with Grace Gibbons, founder of the Mommy Experience. Uh, you can go to her blog site. And uh, so we're speaking about the science of autism, but also what has God infused into this, and what can we extract from it? And when you begin to speak like that, you begin to see differently. Um, and this can happen in a beautiful way through Christ, through Catholicism, through his cross. We'll be right back. We want to hear from you. Plenty more to come. Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So maybe you're at home and you're listening to Grace tell her beautiful story of life and love and her family and, and hard things and beautiful things. And you're thinking, now, I need to know about this. I want to ask her a question. Well, it's a live broadcast. All you need to do is reach us at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205 271 2980 and you can always send us an email Jim and Joy at EWTN.com and hopefully we'll use your question or your comment right here on the air. Grace, right before the break we were going beyond the science mm -hmm. which we always need to have regarding autism sure. to 
faith and asking the question, Lord, have you made some kind of deposit that's in here that I need to extract, that we need to extract as a family or as a couple? Is there some blessing that's in here or some miracle that's in here? Um, share more about how you've come to this place and what that means. Sure, where we left off, I was saying that um, uh, what C.S. Lewis conveys to us is this potential to be, like I had said before, this poetic verse of life that he is now infused into our children. Um, but it hasn't been fully um, actualized or realized yet unless we have this other um, component of Christ and participating in um, uh, his love in the cross, right. um, coming to him and asking him um, for understanding and mercy. And, you know, the stigma on autism in society is, is disheartening because it's something people say is to survive or it's this burden, mm. um, which I think if they have Christ inclusive yeah. of their journey, and science is not a bad thing. I think it's mm -hmm. the way God intends. I think it's a gift, mm -hmm. um, but I think it has to be utilized properly, and Christ must be the center of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's part of the whole, but it's not the whole. Correct. And, and I think sometimes even in society, and I know some other moms of children who are autistic, and the, the fear is you don't want to label your child with right. anything, right. you know, whether it's autism, whatever. You, you, we don't want to label because you're that child's mother, and all you see is my son mm -hmm. and my daughter, right? Mm -hmm. right? right. Um, and you know the beauty of that, and like you said, on this journey, it's like God has given you and your husband the key to your child's heart, right? and, and to love them in a way that no one on this planet is going to love them. Right. And so that's, you know, that's your journey of being the mommy experience, right? Right. And so on your blog, you get to share that with, with other mothers out there. Right. And, and that brings me to um, one of the features I have on my blog, uh, which got a lot of praise. It's one of the most popular articles that I have. Um, it's called The X Factor. Um, so it's three components I like to share with parents to begin their journey of really embracing autism as a gift rather than something that, oh, I got to deal with this. And right. um, The first being uh, to pray. I encourage parents to have a contemplative life, um, to really call on, call on Christ, call on the Blessed Mother, uh, call on the saints. Um, and I couple each of these components with um, the theological virtues. So if we pray and we invite Christ in our journey, it can give us faith. Um, the second is to nourish what we've learned. So we nourish by eradicating anything in our life that can impede us from going forward to helping our children be the best persons that they can be and, and us as mom and dads mm -hmm. to be the best people we can be for our children. And if we nourish and we do this through the sacraments, through the Holy Eucharist uh, daily, uh, I think it's very essential. It gives us hope. Mm -hmm. It gives us hope to move forward. Um, you know, Christ has handpicked us to do this, to do this work. Um, so if we pray and have faith, nourish, have hope, it brings us to the third uh, component, which kind of culminates everything in the X factor, um, and that is to share. So the mommy experience got started because I wanted to share my experience um, with other moms and dads that were going through what me and my husband were going through, and they in turn could share it with us, and we can kind of meet in the middle and you know, bounce off each other and learn from each other and okay, well this is what I did yeah. when this happened and right. try this and but I offer something a little different where I don't totally rely on everything that I'm told about my, my son and daughter. It's more like, okay, what is God trying to relate to me? What is he conveying through yeah. um, my children? And so when you have these components of the X factor come to fruition, you can really begin your journey. Um, mm -hmm in loving the dignity of your children. Okay, we have a phone call. Maria, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Grace. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my question is, uh, can a premature baby be diagnosed or uh, suspected for autism? Um, who, she's now three months old and she makes no eye contact. Uh, she was born a month and a half early um, by C-section. And I'll hang up and hear the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so if you look at the science, three months is early. Um, three months is early to uh, be able to really determine whether or not a child is on the spectrum or has autism. Um, I noticed some things with Kaylee when she was about eight months. She wasn't looking at me either, um, but neither was my eldest daughter. 
So it, it doesn't really mean, it doesn't really necessarily mean that your child is going to be on the spectrum right. or, or be autistic. I also have um, my youngest son, um, who is premature. Sometimes he doesn't look at me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the biggest answer I would give to uh, Maria is that don't be afraid. Even if your child does have autism, if your child is um, exhibiting behaviors that may indicate that the child has, has special needs, don't be afraid. Embrace it. Your, your child depends on you totally. Um, there is going to be a time of, of fear, worry, doubt, frustration, anger, resentment. I went through it. My husband went through it. Girlfriends of mine have gone through it. Um, but keep the talk. Keep mm -hmm. talking about it. Ask. Ask questions. Get, get your child involved. You get involved. Um, so I would suggest to Maria, don't worry too much. Enjoy your child being, you know, three months. It's such an awesome age. And then, you know, go with your instinct. Go with your gut when your child gets yeah. older. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And go ahead and do what yeah. you have to do. Yeah. You were speaking about the X factor, which people can find mm -hmm. on your blog, mm -hmm. um, faith, hope, and love, right. right? And the second one was hope, and I think you mentioned eradicating right. things there. Right. And you were just kind of naming some of the things that eradicate there, weren't you? I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about inordinate fear. Not that sure. she had inordinate fear, but I would sure. imagine that's got to be a component, and the, the fear takes over. What are some of the other things that need to be eradicated? I got some bouncing in my head. If if my child had that diagnosis, but what are some of the other areas? There's fear, I'm thinking of guilt. Mm -hmm. Like I must have did something wrong in my pregnancy, oh, something actually, happened. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Oh yeah, I mean that, so that is so that. real so to every mom. So what are the things that need to be eradicated um, that pop up? That was something I had definitely, um, false guilt. Mm -hmm. um, I thought maybe it was something I did during the pregnancy, right. it was my fault, how, how can I make it up to my child? Um, but then I got a little selfish and started feeling bad for myself. Oh, it's, you know, what was me? My daughter, you know, has autism. My son has autism. What about me, me, me? Um, but in prayer, you know, I kind of saw the light and I was mm -hmm. like, no, this isn't about me. Mm -hmm. This is something that God has asked me yeah. to engage with so that I can be closer to him. And yeah. then my children can then be closer yeah. to him. Yeah. Um, eradicating any false guilt, anger, resentment, uh, fear. Um, I had a lot of that in the beginning, mm -hmm. and I have uh, girlfriends of mine who sometimes have it. I still get it mm -hmm. once in a while. Right. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a continuing journey. It yeah. I don't think it ever stops, but yeah. just keep going. Right. Right. Have faith, faith, right. faith. Um, right. Love God. Know that he's with you. Don't be afraid. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, find a good support system. Um, my husband is my support system. Yeah. He's my rock. He's been great. Um, and we have our moments. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of yelling and right. you know, frustration, but we, we move on, okay. mm -hmm. we move on. Speak to us about your other siblings mm. and how these two precious ones are impacting their lives, whether they know it or not. Mm. So how are you working with the siblings, their own health and well-being, their own identity? They're relating to these children that are you know, dealing with autism, their right. relationships? Right. Uh, um, well, my eldest daughter, Emily, uh, she has, you know, when, when Kaylee got diagnosed, she was only three. Uh, so she didn't understand mm -hmm. what was going on. We had, you know, teachers coming in and out of our home. Kaylee had home services for one year first before she went into a preschool. Um, but she's now seven. So she has questions about why does Kaylee hit me? Why does Kaylee climb? Uh, why is Kaylee not nice to me? Why doesn't she talk to me? Why doesn't she look mm -hmm. at me? Um, I feel like she doesn't like me, yeah. you know. So we have immediate conversations with Emily when she has these questions because we don't want her to ever feel that her feelings aren't important, that they matter. So we stop and we say, okay, this is what's going on. This is why this happens. It's just repeating to her, Kaylee is just like you and me. She just has different needs. We have to approach her yeah. differently. We must have, this is another thing that's very important for parents and families like with children on the spectrum, right. patience. I pray for that every day. Right. <laughs> what a virtue. My husband it sounds too. like you have plenty of opportunity. Um, it's so yeah. hard. My husband and I are like, oh, you know, it's, it yeah. requires a lot of patience. So we yeah. try to convey that to Emily yeah. as well. Yeah. The others are, are, are much younger. They're, you know, kind of yeah. still babies. So, but when their time right. comes, we're going to teach also important them the same thing. With, with Emily then, <clears throat> not to misinterpret. Correct. And that's what she's doing, just like you did, in terms of saying, I feel guilty because maybe I did something. That, so right. this kid's saying, I must be doing something that she hits me, she doesn't like me, she doesn't look in my eyes, what's wrong with me? Right, right. right. So you have to continually keep her in the loop 
right. about what this disorder is like and that it's really not about you. Right. And she has to keep hearing that. Right. And she's, she's like a little mother. She's very good and uh, very loving, very caring, especially with our 10-month-old. She's, she's, she's like me. I was like that at that age. I love babies. And, um, You're one of 11, right? I'm one of 11 children. Mm -hmm. I'm the second eldest mm -hmm. of 11. Um, and we just try to, you know, get Emily to embrace autism. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of it. And I, and I would, I would highly recommend okay. that to parents. I want you to, we only have a couple of minutes left. I sure. want you to speak to people out there <clears throat> who may be getting a diagnosis like this for their mm -hmm. children and how mm -hmm. they are feeling. And then also a hope message and what they could find if they would come to your blog and the mommy experience. Sure, anyone can contact me at any time with any questions they may have, but the first thing I would advise is um, recognize it for what it is. Um, don't avoid, don't be afraid, don't you know, make excuses. I think just this is my child, God chose me, what's my next step? Pray about it, that's why I said before, contemplative life I think is very important. Um, making God, uh, Christ their center, um, asking Christ to really guide them in what it is that their, their next uh, move might be mm -hmm. for their child, because their child has to see and know um, that they're worth every bit of the, the suffering and the pain and the crying and the smiling and all of the wonderful things that they may or may not be able to do in life, um, but that doesn't make them any less worthy of enjoying life like mm -hmm. everybody else. So don't be afraid is my, next, is my first uh, thing that I suggest to parents. Don't be afraid and this is what you can do and so forth. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I know that you've been a comfort to many people. Thank you I know that much. you're in the midst of it. We I bless am. your life, your thank marriage, you. your family, that you'll continue to journey all the way. Thank you for tilting heads today. Thank you for helping us to change the way we see because when we change the way we see, it's not just a material thing, a scientific thing. Mm. It's the mystery of Christ in the midst and what, he's got, what he is, wants to do mm. right. for all of us with this gift. Right. On one side, it's not a gift. On the other side, this is a gift. Mm. On one side, the cross is really doesn't look like a gift, and then it's the ultimate gift. And you've yeah. really helped us to see that today. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much for being with Thank us. You. Thank you. God bless that. you. Thank you. It's God Grace bless Gibbons, you. founder of the Mommy Experience. I'm sure that her uh, blog site has been up the entire time. Get in touch with her. We all stand together with you. Whatever you face, God has some special surprises uh, through some of the most devastating times. That's what Lent is all about. Easter's coming. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Back. Well, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and you can join us live right here on At Home today. We have members in our studio audience from Nebraska, from Illinois, from Florida. Yeah, they've come to Alabama where it's warm. It's not raining today, and it's lovely. So we want you to be a member of our studio audience. Maybe you're thinking it's 2018. I'm going to put this on a list that I want to do. I would love to take a pilgrimage. We would love to have you. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department. Send them an email, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205-271-2966 and make your way to Irondale, Alabama, and then you could always visit about a 50-mile ride up north to the Blessed Shrine of Mother Angelica's Resting Place. We would love to have you. Well, right now we're gonna go all the way to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome to everyone at home. And of course, you all know that yesterday was Ash Wednesday. And in the afternoon, the Holy Father led the traditional penitential procession from the Basilica of Sant'Anselmo to the Basilica of Santa Sabina on the Aventine Hill. And here he was able to say mass, he received ashes, and he also delivered a homily at Santa Sabina. And by the way, this is the first of 40 Roman station churches in Lent. Now, 
Pope Francis urged believers in his homily to, quote, unmask the demons that deaden and paralyze the soul, to allow your hearts to beat in tune with the vibrant heart of Jesus. And then he had three pieces of advice for people, pause, see, and return. Pause in order to look and contemplate, see the real face of Jesus, and return without fear to experience the healing and reconciling tenderness of God. And he said Lent was a time in which we can remedy the dissonant chords of our life. Now, a minute ago, I mentioned, uh, mentioned station churches, and they're actually a very important part of Lent here in Rome. This is actually a tradition that can be traced to Pope St. Gregory the Great. He was late 6th century, early 7th century, and it's been going on with one small interruption for many, many centuries. Now, these churches, there's 40 of them, a different mass is said every morning at 7 o'clock in English, and the churches kind of spruce up. There's a little extra dusting and polishing, and sometimes relics are on display that normally would not be seen by the public. And by the way, 25 of these 40 station churches were once the homes of Romans who converted to Christianity. Great stories. Now, this custom fell into disuse about the time the popes were in Avignon from 1309 to 1377. But in 1959, Pope St. John the 23rd revived the custom. And it's really a great thing. Every day of the week, there's a different church that offers mass, and you can see so many English-speaking pilgrims. You'll see priests, seminarians, men and women religious, university students, embassy personnel, and just the faithful who know about it. And by the way, I post um, the story on my blog about station churches, so go to Jones Rome, and I'll also have the churches where you can go to mass every day if you you're in Rome. And if I can only have a few more seconds today, because we have two pieces of breaking news. One is a telegram that the Holy Father sent to um, Archbishop Wenske of Miami for the terrible killing in the school in that our archdiocese, the 17 dead so far. And then the second piece of news, and both of these will have a little more information on my blog, Jones Rome. The second piece of news is that the press office director, Greg Burke, today confirmed that about once a month, Pope Francis receives victims of sexual abuse, listens to them, tries to help them heal. So important stories, and they'll be on my blog, so go to Jones Rome. But now, back to you at home. Joan, thanks so much for making Rome home, mm -hmm. truly home for all of us. Father Luke Fletcher is here with us. He's a CFR. He's leading the EWTN employee retreat tomorrow at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, Alabama. Father Luke, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful me. to have you here with us. Thank you, it's a joy to be here. Well, good, any comments so, on the show? Um, oh my goodness, I think myself, like so many of the other viewers, were just so deeply moved by Grace and, and the um, witness of her experience. And uh, the thing that really came to mind for me um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to be the chaplain for a group that takes special needs children to Lourdes. Mm -hmm. They do this every Easter. It's an international group. There's thousands and thousands of, of young people and many of them autism and, and other issues that they're struggling with. And we were there and I, uh, two memories are really funny. One is we were getting ready for mass and there was a little boy, looked like he was having a meltdown. Mm -hmm. And so the bishops and the priests were all trying to be sensitive to that and as we we're processing in, I look over at him and he wasn't having a meltdown. He had a little puppy dog uh, stuffed animal and he was waving to us uh -huh. with this thing. It was like he was communicating differently. It just was so beautiful. And I was there looking and if you've ever been to Lourdes, you know, we just had the feast day of, of Our Lady of Lourdes, the day of the sick. It's so beautiful there. It's a little village mm -hmm. and there's a river that goes through and it's kind of mountainous. The uh, church basilica almost looks like the Disney castle. Mm -hmm. And of course there's that grotto where the presence of Our Lady is just so strong there in that water that flows, that spring, and uh, so many healings, so many mm -hmm. things. And I was there and praying, obviously, for healing for the, the children. And, and uh, I had this moment where I was just being overwhelmed by the beauty of the place, the beauty of the story, St. Bernadette and the Virgin Mary. And uh, as I was taking in the beauty of all of that, I felt the Lord speak to my heart. And he said, more beautiful is the soul of each one of my little mm -hmm. ones. 
you know, and I was there looking at all these children, mm -hmm. you know, praying for their healing. And I realized that God healed something in me, mm -hmm. gave me a new perspective, a new way of seeing things, as mm -hmm. you had said, mm -hmm. you know, that that value and that dignity that is there that shines in a very special way in these special needs children. Mm -hmm. It was just really overwhelming. Uh, that memory came back to me as I was listening to Grace yeah. and mm -hmm. hearing about her experience. Yeah. And that's that's what I was thinking. We don't have much time left, mm -hmm. I, but I, the question for me that I wanted to ask you was, um, we often think about what we do for the least, but what did yeah. the least do for us? Yeah. What would you think about that? What, yeah. what would you say, what are the least doing for us? Why do we have, because we live in a, a world that wants to eliminate them, yeah. wants to throw them away and get them out of the way. We don't want these least, but why has God given them to us? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think um, the Lord is giving them as a gift for a much needed corrective, mm. the confusion of our times. Wow. They're there, wow. they're, they, you know, they love, they do what they can do. They and laugh. They laugh, they're, they're mm -hmm. joyful, and, and, and it is just amazing to see that witness that in some ways brings what life is really about into focus. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the Lord has gifted us with people who have these. I see it really as a gift, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and what, a, what a gift it is. Yeah. That is very, very powerful. A corrective for us. Mm -hmm. Again, it's changing the way we see because we're so burdened it seems by the least or how do we eliminate these difficult situations or people yeah. or or we have situations that have taken place like even in, in Florida did God mm -hmm. make that happen no but how could how could it ch help change us in some way how could we come together as a nation and value the dignity of every every person how do we come and repent as a nation when we have a whole segment 60 million little ones that we've killed so we it's not like we could just be about this segment it, we have to be at all the segments, all the people. Father, would you give us a blessing that uh, we might be renewed as a nation and repent and believe the gospel? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, give us new eyes to see. Mm -hmm. Renew our minds to understand. Give us new hearts to love. May the Lord give you his peace, and may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Thank Father Luke, you, for Father being Luke. with us. Hey, we're all in this together. You're an important part of this family. Life, marriage, and the family will prevail upon the face of the earth throughout the whole world. God bless you and all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.